Okay, so uh, this is what I'm talking about is uh, basically how to screen. Um, and I have to give a, my, you know, the, the general conflict of interest declaration. Um, as many of you know, I the co-inventor of the 4K score. Uh, so uh, if a lot of people get PSA tests, then a lot will need the 4K score, and so I could make a lot of money. Um, so what I'm arguing for is fewer men to get fewer PSA tests. So please listen to what I say, put it in practice, and then I'll make less money. Okay, so. Um, all right, so we're talking about PSA. Everyone says, oh, it's the, what's the PSA debate, or it's a big controversy. I'm a very open-minded guy. Um, there's a couple of things I won't debate, however. I'm not going to debate whether man went to the moon, or whether 9-11 was an inside job, or whether Shakespeare really wrote Shakespeare. I'm also not going to debate whether there's a lot of overdiagnosis caused by PSA testing. And I'm not going to debate whether there's any mortality benefit at all. I don't think any reasonable academic would say that there's, it's, it's an open question whether there is a, um, any mortality benefit. That was, that was true in 2008, maybe 2009, 2010. It's not true anymore. So what is the controversy? The controversy is not, does it work at all? Does, is there any benefit? It's, is there, any, is there more benefit than harm? And so what do we mean by that? Well, the benefits are mortality reduction. Can we reduce the risk that someone would die of prostate cancer and the harms, as everyone knows, is overdiagnosis and overtreatment. So this reminds me, uh, this is of, of, of another problem we've had in America. This is when I was, uh, the year I was born. I've actually shown this slide before, and somebody said, wow, that was a really uptight set of parents who really insisted on safety at the time because the kids were actually sitting down in the car. But this was the, the year I was born, this was, this was the issue, right? And you could say, well, there are benefits to having cars, right? There's, uh, you know, fun and you can drive to work and, uh, you know, go where you want. Uh, and there are harms, 50,000 Americans dying on the road a year. Now, what we did the year I was born, 1967, said, well, there are benefits, are there harms, what should, should we ban driving or not, right? It wasn't take it or leave it. But that seems to be the debate right now on prostate cancer. Okay, we accept there are harm, uh, benefits, but there are also harms, so let's make a choice one way or the other. Are, they, are these harms worth the benefits? What we did in the automobiles was harm reduction, right? So. This is like a modern family and all nicely buckled in. And we've, we've reduced the risk of death on the roads by about 50% uh, in, the, in the past 50 years. Okay? It's a harm reduction approach. And obviously we've managed to keep almost all of the benefits of you know, ec economics and you know, being able to go to the beach and do, do drive where you want. So can we apply a similar principle to PSA screening? Uh, now, why has it been a problem? I mean, I've previously on many occasions described PSA screening as a public health fiasco or a disaster. And that's, well, what have we been doing for many, many years, right? For the majority of the time in which we've been doing PSA screening, we've been screening old men. Uh, I, I think the, the number, if I get this right, an 80-year-old with three comorbidities for many years had a higher chance of getting a PSA test than a 55-year-old. Right, those were the guys we were screening. Uh, I sat on the NCCN guidelines committee for, for many years, and the criteria for biopsy, we just kept on adding them. You know, if you had a high PSA, if you had a low free to total ratio, if you had a high PSA velocity, if you had a positive DRE, you know, if you, if you weren't feeling well that, I mean, it was like trying to get out of the, uh, the office, the urologist's office without a biopsy. You had to jump through so many hoops. So we were biopsying virtually everyone. Uh, we were aggressively treating low-risk disease. Someone knows for many years, 90% or more of men from, uh, with low-risk cancer would get uh, treated. Um, and this was data from CAPTURE. So the opposite was also true. We were under-treating high-risk disease. Men with the uh, CAPRA scores of 8, 9, or 10, it was maybe only 10 or 20% of those were getting surgery. Most of them were getting primary androgen deprivation therapy, which is known to be ineffective. And then, of course, this big problem that who was treating our patients were often low-volume providers. The modal most common number of radical prostatectomies done by urologists who did at least one in 2005 was one. 
and the median was three. So almost most uh, of the surgeons doing it would, would, didn't do many of them and probably weren't getting very good results. Okay, so what can we do about it? This is a, a paper written by Siegfried uh, Carlson um, and in, I think published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. Uh, and the way she put it was five golden rules to transform a PSA screening. I just want to focus on the middle three. Uh, I think you know, it's, I think everyone agrees that you need to get consent, that this should not, PSA test should not be given to a guy uh, unless you've told him that you're going to do it and explained the reasons for it. I, I, this happens an awful lot. It's happened to several PSA uh, skeptics, well-known people who say you shouldn't do PSA tests, have had their doctors give them PSA tests and they've called me up and I'm like, yes, my, you know. Um, and then I think, you know, we, we can leave the regionalization debate to, to another time. But let's focus on these, these middle, uh, middle three. Okay, so everyone's seen this, right? This is the uh, incidence of, of cancer in males over time. This is prostate cancer. This is 1987. Suddenly, you know, all goes up. Number of cases ri raises, uh, rises enormously and doesn't sort of go back down again and stabilize. So all of this, above this line, this is all over diagnosis. Um, has, has anyone, everyone's seen this, right? Has anyone seen this split out by age? That's it by age, okay? So this is men aged 50 to 65, this is 65 to 75, and this is over 75. Almost all of that over diagnosis was in older men. So, you know, you, it, it's often said, and, uh, you know, there's figures thrown around about uh, that, for example, about a million men have been overdiagnosed with prostate cancer, which is, which is a public health disaster for a million men to go through the trauma of hearing they have cancer, and many of them getting treated unnecessarily, and then having to go through the sort of side effects that are associated with our prostate cancer treatments is a complete disaster. Uh, and most of that could have been avoided had we just not screened older men. Um, and so this is some estimates we uh, published in uh, BMC Medicine a few years back, and this is the cumulative proportion of overdiagnoses by age. So let's look here. 58% were in men less than 70, which means that 42% of the overdiagnoses were in men aged 70 or over. 85% were in men aged 60 or over. So if we are just more careful about how we do this screening in older men, we could have a very, very dramatic effect on overdiagnosis, right? We just don't screen any men over the age of, uh, of 70 or over. We reduce it by uh, more than 40%, close to half, right? Um, so th the other thing we have to think about is, uh, you know, another quick way of or another important way of dealing with overdiagnosis is to think about the characteristics of the PSA test. And this is a sort of standard issue, uh, the critique of PSA that you see, you know, evidence-based versus anecdotal medicine. The evidence is that this is, Hans, this isn't how they do a PSA test, right? Just checking. It's not, it's not a urine stick. No, but anyway, um, evidence-based evidence is PSA doesn't work, and the anecdote is, oh, you know, Joe Torrey is saying that he, he, you know, PSA saved his life, and, and you know, this is a very typical. PSA is neither sensitive nor specific. So this is what we've heard about um, PSA for a long time. And, in a, and I kind of generally agree with that, but that's PSA is neither sensitive nor specific for prostate cancer. And prostate cancer is a very uninteresting endpoint because every man will get prostate cancer if he lives long enough. Um, so what we really want to know is whether it's sensitive or specific for aggressive prostate cancer. Um, and this is work with Hans Lilia, where a single PSA at the age of 60 predicts your risk of death within 25 years. The area under the curve is about 0.9. And you can see here that, 80, that uh, in the top quartile, top 25% of PSAs, so that's a PSA of around a little less than two, but around two, you will pick up 80% of the deaths in the next uh, 25, uh, sorry, of metastases in the next um, 25 years. Um, so it, it's plenty sensitive, that's not the problem. The problem is specificity. So this is sort of uh, typical numbers that you see in US community practice. For every 100 men that are subjected to biopsy, um, about half are benign. Um, and then, you know, here's, here's your clear overdiagnosis. And then these are the only 20% really have the cancers that we 
we want to find. Um, and so how do we actually focus on the cancers we want to find? Uh, this is work with Hans Lilia, who uh, he discovered when you measure a PSA and you say your PSA is, I don't know, three nanograms per milliliter, that's not three, milli that's not three milligrams, nanograms of one particular molecule, but a bunch of molecules. And if you me measure them separately, you get a good insight into whether the cause of the PSA elevation is benign or uh, malignant. Uh, and so we developed the 4K score. This was a US study of uh, 26 different community centers, about 1,000 patients. Uh, the very accurate uh, prediction of high-grade cancer, this is a score just to look at the high-grade cancer, and it was almost perfectly calibrated. Uh, this was, we also looked at its long-term uh, value in men who, who never underwent screening. Uh, so this was a sort of retrospective study from epidemiologic data. And um, amongst men with a higher PSA, uh, what was your chance that you would get metastasis at 20 years? And you can see the discrimination of the 4K panel is, is really very, 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 very good. Uh, and you can see that uh, this, is, this is all men with a PSA above three. And this is their risk of metastasis. And this is exactly why we worry about uh, biopsying these men, because at 20 years, they have about a 10% risk of metastasis. But you can divide that up into uh, about 60% of the men with a high score, about 40% of men with a low score. And you can see there's an incredibly low risk at, of METs at 10 years uh, amongst men who have a high PSA but a low 4K score, which means you can, as a urologist, you can be extremely confident that if you don't biopsy those, uh, men, nothing bad is going to happen anytime soon. Um, and this is the, the impact of actually using the 4K score in practice. Uh, this was uh, in, uh, given to a bunch of urologists, and they asked what happened to about a 1,000 patients. And they reduced the rate of biopsy by about 65%. Okay, so out, out of the, these rural men that they were going to biopsy, and this is the number of men they actually biopsied after they ordered the 4K score and looked at the results. We can do a back of the envelope calculation now. If you don't screen men over 70, you reduce over diagnosis by 40%. So you're left with 60% of, of, of the total amount of overdiagnosis. Where we reflex marker tests, depending on how you do the math, it's either two, 50, half or two thirds reduction in the number of Gleason 6 cancers you find. So you've now, re now you've reduced it by another 50%. So you, you, you're saying without really even really trying or doing that much, we've reduced the amount of overdiagnosis by 70%. So there's this balance between, okay, yeah, we cure cancer, but then we, uh, we get a lot of overdiagnosis. Well, if you just do a few simple things, you dramatically reduce that amount of overdiagnosis. So what are the MSKCC guidelines are to start at age 45, and it's a sort of simple red light, green light, and orange, amber light. Um, so if you've got a high, higher PSA, you consider biopsy, maybe using a reflex test. Um, if you, in the intermediate range, yes, keep screening quite regularly. Uh, if it's low, you screen irregularly and you stop at 60. Uh, and the, the reason for the early start is this is a single PSA in the mid to late 40s, incredibly strong uh, risk stratification. Uh, for metastases uh, over a 25-year period, very extremely low rates uh, in the bottom three quartiles. Uh, and then, so the MSK guidelines start early, stop early, right? We showed that 85% of the overdiagnosis is in men over uh, 60, so let's restrict who we're screening over the age of 60. Uh, and this is data from Sigrid Carlson, um, who compared uh, the Jotaborg randomized screening trial with the uh, Malmo uh, cohort study. And so we were able to sort of do a subgroup analysis of the effects of screening by your baseline PSA uh, level. And what you can see is in men with PSA less than two at age 60, there was absolutely no benefit whatsoever, no decrease in death rate. About 40% of the total overdiagnosis uh, reported were in men with PSAs less than two uh, at age 60. So potentially you could reduce overdiagnosis by a further 40% in addition to what I've previously elucidated in terms of reducing overdiagnosis rates. Uh, and then, so we find if, if we don't screen older men, we use reflex tests, we stop screening younger men if they have lower PSAs, we can reduce overdiagnosis enormously. We can also reduce um, overtreatment 
just by uh, doing active surveillance, not uh, uh, treating uh, men who uh, are diagnosed with prostate cancer. You know, there's a lot of these criteria, you can't have more than two cores, and no core can be greater than, uh, you know, our view, and we've now produced quite a lot of data, is, you know, we're having this debate whether Gleason 6 is actually cancer or not. It really doesn't matter how much you have, pretty give or take, right? So this is pretty much the criteria we use. If you have Gleason 6, we need a good reason to treat you. Uh, and the, I can show you these, these are the kind of rates we have at, at MSK. This is our surgical quality assurance system, and this is the proportion of the caseload of various surgeons uh, that is low-risk cancer, and it's extremely low. So it's a typical surgeon, maybe one in 20 of their cases or more are um, low-risk ca cancer. So this is the approach that we're recommending at MSK. It's a harm reduction approach just like we're putting on seat belts and putting in airbags in our car, how do we prevent all the overtreatment and overdiagnosis of prostate cancer, maintaining the benefits? You start and sc stop screening earlier. You don't biopsy a man without a very good reason, likely to be a secondary test. Uh, you don't treat Gleason 6. We reckon doing that would reduce overdiagnosis by at least 75% and a similar or greater reduction in overtreatment. Thanks very much.